I'm going to be talking to you about the competition and the postmaptic density for the PDZ domains of PSD95. Now, this is an important thing to consider when talking about long-term potentiation, which is a cellular process that underlies memory and learning in the brain. And so long-term potentiation at excitatory synapses is the activity-dependent strengthening of the synapse. And in this picture, it depicts that. By here's, the syn here's a non-potentiated syn synapse, and here's the presynaptic side and the postsynaptic side. This is where the postsynaptic density would be. And you can see that there's amatite glutamate receptors and uh, NMDA-type glutamate receptors. And once long-term potentiation has occurred, the synapse grows in size. And also, there's an increase in the amatite glutamate receptors in the postsynaptic density. So the postsynaptic density is called the postsynaptic density because it's dense with protein. And uh, this is a picture that represents that, but this is not all the proteins that are in the postsynaptic density, but it does demonstrate the general architecture, where you have these scaffolding proteins that um, create uh, an anchoring system for other proteins that are important for biological processes in the postsynaptic density. And one of these scaffolding proteins is PSD95. It's extremely abundant, and so is Syngap. Syngap is very abundant. And Syngap interacts with PSD95 through its PDZ ligand, binding to the PDZ domains of PSD95. Now, Syngap is not the only PDZ ligand containing protein in the PSD. There are many others, but a few of them that I'm going to talk about today are TARPs, which are a subunit of the AMPA receptor, um, which will effectively anchor the AMPA receptor in the postsynaptic density through the association of TARPs with the PDZ domains of PSD95. There's also NMDA receptors and neuroligands. Now I'm interested in AMPA receptor trafficking during long-term potentiation, and this can be thought of as a three-step process. And the first step is that there needs to be an increased uh, exocytosis at parasynaptic sites. And so the exocytosis or endocytosis, so the insertion or the removal of AMPA receptors, is controlled through RAP and RAS. And RAP, when RAS is more highly activated, then you will have a net increase in exocytosis and more AMPA receptors. When RAP is uh, more active, then you will have a net decrease in AMPA receptors because there will be an increase in endocytosis. And RAP and RAS activity is controlled by Syngap. Syngap is a GTPase activating protein that will negatively regulate RAP and RAS through that enzymatic activity. And whether it's, re it's negatively regulating RAP or RAS more at any given point in time uh, can be controlled by campinase 2. And campinase 2 is activated during long-term potentiation. And when that happens, it phosphorylates Syngap. And when that happens, Syngap will inhibit RAP more than RAS, and there will be a net increase in exocytosis of the receptors uh, at parasynaptic sites, and that is step one. So step two is the lateral diffusion of these AMPA receptors into the postsynaptic density. Step three is the diffusional trapping of these AMPA receptors in the postsynaptic density. And this step is free limiting. So here's the diagram of PSN95. And uh, when I'm talking about the PDZ domains of PSD95, I'm talking about uh, PDZ1, 2, and 3, which are all in the end terms of the protein. And here's a diagram of Syngap alpha 1. Now, Syngap alpha 1 has many protein domains, and the ones that I'm going to be focusing on today is the RASGAP and C2 domains, which are important and required for the GTPase activating activity of Syngap. And the PDZ ligand here, the C terminal protein, is what binds the PDZ domains of PSD95. And you can see here there are some phosphorylation sites uh, that can help regulate this activity um, by uh, phosphorylation sites by CAM kinase 2. And this is a disordered domain of Syngap, which Mary Kennedy will be uh, talking more about in her talk. So like I said, Syngap is not the only PDZ ligand containing protein in the postsynaptic density, um, but it is highly abundant and it can bind to all three of the PDZ domains although it doesn't have the same affinity for all of those PDZ domains. So it doesn't bind them as well. So it will bind PDZ1 and PDZ3 better than it will the others. Now, other PDZ ligand containing proteins have the same um, chain differences in affinity for different uh, PDZ domains, and some of the proteins don't bind some of the PDZ domains. So each PDZ domain, or PSD9, PSD95, represents a uh, situation of dynamic competition in the postsynaptic density for binding sites. So what does this look like? Well, in a wild type or a basal state, that uh, Syngap will be bound to some number of the PDZ domains of PSD95. And when it's bound there, that means that other PDZ ligand containing proteins won't be binding there. And so it limits the amount of slots or positions available for binding and anchoring in the postsynaptic density. 
However, that can be changed. You can reduce the ability of Syngap to compete for these binding sites by uh, simply reducing it, as is the case in a Syngap heterozygote animal or a haploid insufficient state. And in this situation, you have less Syngap, and so you have more open slots for PDZ ligand containing binding proteins to anchor themselves in the postsynaptic density. This is uh, also true for the situation of uh, long term potentiation. During long term potentiation, we know that Syngap is phosphorylated by kind Camprinase 2, and that phosphorylation reduces the affinity of Syngap for the PDZ domains of PSD95. And so it effectively falls off, which allows other PDZ ligand containing proteins to bind in the postsynaptic density. So this model predicts that in both of these situations, that as you reduce the amount of Syngap that's binding, that you would have an increase in the other uh, PDZ ligand containing proteins that are binding. In order to test this model, I looked at Syngap heterozygote mice, and I took a sample set of six uh, mice each, either wild type or hetero heterozygote, and I isolated the postsynaptic densities from those animals, and I pulled them together. And I looked at the abundance of Syngap and other targets as a ratio of PSD95. And I did this ratio to PSD95 because I really care about the abundance of these proteins to uh, PSD95, which they're binding to. So in the heterozygote samples compared to wild type, I saw a decrease in Syngap, which is exactly what I would expect. They're heterozygotes, they should have less. But I did see an increase in TARPs LRRTM2s and neuroligand 2s, which the model predicted. So this supports the model. I also looked in a more robust sample set in which I took uh, PSDs from individual animals this time instead of pulling them together. I looked at males and females and um, mice and rats of two different age groups. So the sample size was much larger. And so in this representation of the data, each one of these individual points represents a single animal. So I can look at the correlation of these protein levels in individual brains. And so here on the x-axis, you have Syngap levels, and the y-axis, you have TARPs. And what the model would predict is that as Syngap is reduced, the TARPs would increase. So you would expect that there would be like a population of uh, animals in this range. And the opposite is true that as Syngap increases, that TARP will decrease, and so there would be a population in this range. And what that would end up looking like is an anticorrelation. And so here, when you do a test for an anticorrelation, you see that there's no significant anticorrelation in this data set. But if you look at the populations of wild type animals and heterozygotes individually, you see that wild types still don't have a correlation, but heterozygotes do. So when we perturb the uh, dynamics of the competition in the postsynaptic density, by reducing the amount of syngap present, then we start seeing that there is a correlation where the, the less syngap um, that is present, the more tarps that are present in individual animal brains. So, uh, when you look at this data a little bit further, you can ask the question of where is this correlation coming from in the heterozygotes? Is it that all animal types are contributing equally? And the answer is no. It turns out that the correlation is being driven by the heterozygote females. And this group contains female mice and rats of seven and a half and 12 weeks old. So it doesn't matter uh, the species or the age of the animal, they're all contributing to this uh, anti-correlation. But you do not see that in um, heterozygote males. So we're seeing a sex difference in the response of uh, the composition of the postsynaptic density to the removal of Syngap from the system. So I also tested this model by looking at the composition of the postsynaptic density in neuronal cultures. So in this experiment, I cultured hippocampal and cortical neurons from rats for about 20 days in culture, and then I extracted the postsynaptic densities for them. And so here in this basal state where there's been no induction of um, LTP, I can ask the same question that I did in the animals that simply is when Syngap is either removed entirely or reduced, is there an increase in PDZ ligand containing proteins? And that is true for TARPs here. So here's the wild type level, and you can see that there's a significant increase in both of these sample sets. I can go further. Um, in neuronal cultures, and I can induce uh, long-term potentiation uh, through chemical means. And it's one control for making sure that actually happened is to look at camprinase 2 alpha phosphorylation at threonine 286. And so if this site is phosphorylated significantly over basal type levels, then it would indicate that the chemical LTP treatment worked, and that's the case in all of these samples. So the treatment is working. So now, what actually happens? Our model would predict that in a situation of wild type where you have Syngap bound to the PZ domains of PSD95, and then phosphorylation occurs through camprinase 2 during LTP, 
that the same gap would be reduced in its ability to compete and more PDV ligand containing proteins would um, be anchored in the postnatal density. And for TARPs, that is true. You see this uh, significant increase. Now, TARPs are a subunit of the amper receptors. So um, you would expect that there is also that this is representative of an increase in amper receptors in the postsynaptic density, which we know occurs during long-term contagiation. Now, for the heterozygote and the um, null or the knockout samples, we don't see that same increase. And this isn't necessarily surprising because we know that long-term potentiation is attenuated in um, thin gap deficient animals. So in this system, I can manipulate it further. I can start asking um, interesting questions like what happens when I uh, remove only part of the function of syngap? So here, if I introduce a construct of syngap back into the cultures that are deficient in syngap and this lacks the RAS gap activity, uh, what will happen? Or when it lacks the PZ ligand um, activity. And of course, the expectation is when I introduce back the wild type construct that I'm going to restore uh, the wild type phenotype. So this is a control. And so I introduced these constructs using Simbus virus in which um, messenger RNA was deposited into the neurons and, and it was a transient transfection. So here is a control. So I want to make sure that my viruses were actually infecting and um, expressing. So here's the, uh, the heterozygote level of syngap F1. It's about 50% less uh, than what wild type is. And in each of these cases where I infected with um, either any one of these viruses, I saw that there was a significant um, increase compared to the heterozygote level. So the infection is working. And I can start asking questions about what happens in the basal state. We know that the heterozygote has this increase in TARPs in the basal state over wild type levels. Um, and so can I rescue that by applying a wild type um, expression construct of syngap alpha one? And the answer is yes, I can. But when I apply either of the mutant uh, constructs, it does not rescue it. So this says that both the gap activity and also the uh, PDZ ligand are important uh, for maintaining wild type levels of TARPs in the PSD. I can also look at the viruses during uh, LTP and see if that restores any of these can restore the wild type uh, phenotype. And so we saw that previously in wild types that during uh, chem LTP that you will have an increase in the TARPs uh, over basal levels. And that's not true for the heterozygote sample. And this is a control where I've infected with just green fluorescent protein, which has nothing to do with syngap. So the virus itself can't restore the um, wild type phenotype. But when I infect with wild type syngap alpha one, I do see a restoration, but I don't see that by, for either of the other means. And again, this just indicates that both of those domains of syngap are important for regulating this. So as um, a summary of the, the, the model here is that Syngap is holding places of PDZ domains in the postsynaptic density that inhibits other PDZ containing ligands from binding. And during um, long-term potentiation, these slots can open up because Syngap will um, be removed uh, through a reduction of affinity for the PDZ domains of PSD95. And then you can have things like TARPs come in and bind um, and trans amper receptors in the postsynaptic density. And in the syngap um, heterozygote state, you're going to see that uh, you can have an enhancement of the PDZ ligand containing proteins in the postsynaptic density um, because there is a reduction in the competition from uh, syngap. And we demonstrated that in our animal models. So I'd like to thank all the people that made this work happen and our funding sources. And here's some references so you can look into more details in the experiments that I mentioned. Thank you.